Welcome to Module 4, DLS 105, Demonstration of RMC QRA Calcs. RMC QRA Calcs is a suite of Microsoft Excel spreadsheets used to perform the risk calculations for typical dam and levee safety projects. After completing this module, course participants should be able to demonstrate how to use RMC QRA Calcs to perform the calculations for our risk assessment. We will start with an overview of the spreadsheets, then step through how to use each one individually. Homework 4 will be used as an example for each spreadsheet. Please have the homework file available and follow along as we go. We will begin with an overview of the spreadsheets. The RMC QRA Calc spreadsheets can be downloaded from the RMC website. Follow the address at the top of the screen, then click download. The spreadsheets will be combined in a single zip file. RMC QRA Calcs was developed to support risk assessments for dam and levee safety. These spreadsheet tools are used to calculate and assess the incremental risk, non-breach risk, and residual risk for typical dam and levee projects. There are four main spreadsheets. Data from RMC stage frequency distribution feeds into RMC PFM risk, which then feeds into RMC project risk. RMC risk summary and plots links with RMC project risk to plot the data. A fifth spreadsheet, RMC team elicitation worksheet, is an optional spreadsheet tool that can be used during a team elicitation to organize nodal estimates and to put them in the proper format to be copied and pasted into RMC PFM risk. starting with the stage frequency distribution spreadsheet. This spreadsheet is used to assign probability distributions so that we can replicate the stage frequency curve and its uncertainty from RMC RFA as best as possible in our analysis. Data from the spreadsheet will later be used in RMC PFM risk when completing risk calculations for a potential failure mode. To use the spreadsheet, macros must be enabled and the Excel add-on at risk is required. The yellow shaded cells are where the user data is input and the white cells are built-in calculations. Whenever you are copying and pasting input data, always paste its values because many of the cells have conditional formatting to alert you when there is an error. The first step to using the spreadsheet is to select a vertical datum from the drop-down menu. If the datum you need is not listed, you can type it into the box. The elevation datum that is used must be consistent across all the different spreadsheets that will be used in the analysis. Next, input the 5th, 50th, and 95th percentile stage frequency relationships, along with the expected or mean stage frequency relationship into the tables. This data will be provided by your h, &H engineer and will typically come from RMC RFA. You are allowed 50 inputs. You may have to trim down the data you are given. If you must trim the data, be sure to include all inflection points when defining these relationships. The stages should be input from low to high without blanks or duplicates. When copying and pasting data, always paste as values. The maximum stage for all the different stage frequency relationships on this sheet must be consistent. This may require extending some of these curves through visual extrapolation. There is a plot below these tables that you can reference to make sure your visual extrapolation is reasonable. This is possibly the only time that extrapolation is a good idea. And in most instances, the probability that we are extrapolating to are going to be so low that they have essentially no impact on the risk assessment itself. Once you have the data input, verify that there are no errors. Input cell shading will turn red if there's an error in the relationship. The square in the top left corner of the sheet will also turn red if there's an error, and an error message will also appear next to the plot below the tables. The plot below the table should be used to verify the shape of the stage frequency relationships before moving on to the next tab in the spreadsheet. On the probability distribution tab, use the drop down menus in column H to select the probability distribution for each stage. Options include beta pert, 
inverse Gaussian, and uniform distributions. To use the expected value without a distribution, do not pick anything from the dropdown. Just leave the cell blank. By default, the stages are set to be the same as those used to define the 50th percentile curve, and probabilities are interpolated for the other relationships. You can manually adjust the stages as necessary to account for known inflection points and to best define the stage frequency curve. The button at the top of the spreadsheet can be used to reset the spreadsheet to the default stages. Next, verify that there are no errors in column L. Typically, a beta PERT distribution will be the best place to start for all stages, but sometimes the data will not fit the distribution. The inverse Gaussian distribution usually does well for the upper pools that have a greater range of uncertainty when a beta PERT distribution cannot be used. Whatever distribution you use, the goal is for the distribution output to match the data provided by the H&H &H engineer as best as possible. After assigning the distributions, we now have everything we need to run a simulation. But before doing so, check the settings. The appropriate at-risk settings for government computers should be preset in the spreadsheet. The at-risk settings can be checked by clicking on the settings icon. Under the general tab, multiple CPU simulations should be disabled under the sampling tab, unless you are using a non-government computer or an air gap computer. Smart sensitivity analysis should also be disabled. The number of iterations should be set to at least 10,000. Click Simulate to begin the simulation. A dialog box will pop up related to the correlation matrices. Click Yes to continue the simulation. After running the analysis, click on Stage Frequency Plot tab to graphically view the results. The dashed lines on the plot are for the input data, and the data markers are for the output data. We'll want to verify that the expected value output lines up with the expected value input. Sometimes the distribution outputs will not line up well with the expected value at the upper stages. This is usually because of how the curves were extrapolated to force each curve to reach the same maximum stage. If the expected value output data does not line up with the expected value input data, the extrapolation or perhaps the assigned distribution should be adjusted through trial and error to get the best fit possible. After running the simulation, you can use Explore Data and click the footprint to step through each iteration. Iteration results will plot as a gray line on the stage frequency plot when the footprint is checked. Please note that the table may have several columns of errors, but they're from unused distributions, so the errors are not a problem. The last step is to save the file. When you save the spreadsheet, a dialog box will pop up asking you how you want to save the simulation data. When files get large, it is best to save the data as an external file. Save the data file in the same folder as the spreadsheet. With each worksheet of RMC QRA calcs, we are going to use homework four as an example. I will show you how to set up a potential failure mode and how to move that data into the RMC project risk spreadsheet. It'll be your job to finish the remaining two failure modes to complete the homework. To start, we need to get the hydrologic hazard input and find an appropriate distribution for the data using RMC stage frequency distribution. So to start, we are gonna open the RMC stage frequency distribution spreadsheet. For these things to run, we also need to make sure that we have at risk running. So I'll do that now. I'll give it a minute to initialize. All right, so that should be set. So I have the cover sheet, it gives you the opportunity to plug in the project name if you wanted, you know, risk assessment purpose who's preparing it and what date. Uh, we'll skip over that for now and just go straight into um, the stage frequency inputs. Um, 
The first input there is for our vertical datum, which already matches what we have in our uh, homework in ABD 88. That's, that's going to be the datum we typically want to use for our core projects. And we want to make sure that the datum is consistent in this spreadsheet and then all spreadsheets the rest of the way. So to, to use this spreadsheet, the first thing we're going to do is just copy and paste the data that we have from the homework to get our um, 5th percentile, our 50th percentile, 95th percentile, and then our expected value stage frequency relationships. Um, in all of these relationships, the, uh, the stages are the same, so I'll start by copying that table and then pasting its values into uh, the spreadsheet here. Remember, we always want to paste as values unless the spreadsheet um, specifies otherwise um, because there's some underlying conditional formatting that can help us out and we don't want to override that. Okay, so I got my stages in and now I'm going to paste in the, um, the probabilities that I have for the 5th, 50th, 95th, and expected. I would also say be careful to make sure that you paste them into the right spot. I've seen, uh, had people ask me in the past why the spreadsheet wasn't working and it was because they had the 95th and 5th flipped. So when these are plotted, and we'll look at the plot at the bottom, we're going to want the red line for the 95th to make sure that that's on top and the green line for the 5th is on the bottom. Okay, so I have all those pasted in now, and then I can scroll down, and it should look like so, where I've got the red line is my 95th, the blue is the 50th, and then the green line is my 5th um, percentile, 5th, 50th, 95th, black line is the expected. Um, a lot of times when we're doing this uh, in practice, they're not going to be as neat and clean as what I gave you for the homework. You might have um, more stages that will f than what will fit in these tables. So you have to go through and kind of pare that down, cut out any points that aren't necessary, but still making sure that you have all the inflection points. Uh, the other thing that's really important is that you make sure that each of these relationships go up to the same max stage. Now, the data that you're given won't always do that, so you might have to um, extrapolate, particularly this bottom curve, your fifth percentile. Um, I know in session two we talked about never extrapolating. This is one of the rare instances in which we will, and usually you're going from a really small probability to an even smaller probability. It's not something that's going to have much impact on the final result. But in order to set a distribution for these higher stages, we need all of those stages to be consistent. If, if for example, it wasn't, let's say this was 5591.7, oops, you'll get an error message here telling you that your maximum stages aren't consistent. So you'll want to fix that. And then Whenever you're put, punching data in, if, for example, you had something out of order, it, it should tell you that too. Okay. So once we have those um, stage frequency relationships input, we'll move on to the next tab, which is for the probability distribution. And here is where we're going to assign what distribution we're going to want to use. Uh, this spreadsheet uses those alt distributions where, um, based on what I pick, it's going to try to fit that distribution but match the 5th, 50th, and 95th percentiles. Um, best practice is to start with beta pert. That's going to work for most things. So take that and drag that down for each of them. And you'll know if it works by looking at uh, these two columns here. If you don't have any errors, then the data will fit that distribution. And you're good to go. Um, so in this example, beta part worked for all of them. It, it's not always the case, but it's usually the case that that'll work. 
If it doesn't, you can look at a lot of times the inverse Gaussian will start to work better for those higher stages. Okay, so once I have um, those probability distributions assigned, the next step is to run it. So I can click at risk. It's always good to check your settings. So when you're working on um, a government computer or a computer where you cannot automatically enable macros, you're going to want to disable multiple CPUs. So what at risk does, if you have multiple CPUs, it will open a new instance of Excel every time it tries to use a different CPU. But if it can't automatically enable the macros, then none of the calculations are going to work. So that's why we're forced to disable it. Unfortunately, it makes things run a little slower, but it kind of is what it is. If you're running on an air gap and can force it to uh, enable macros, then you can use you know, the multiple CPUs. It's encouraged. It runs a lot faster. So it's good to have those air gap machines when you've got those simulations that take a long time. Um, also good to check your sampling to make sure that smart sensitivity is disabled. There's no reason to have that run. It just bogs it down. Click OK there, and then we will go ahead and click Simulate. Um, it'll ask us about this correlation matrix having multiple inputs assigned to the same matrix position. That's OK. In fact, it's intentional. Um, the reason that is is because all those other distributions that you're not selecting here are all still running in the background. So that's by design. So this spreadsheet usually runs pretty quick. Usually only takes a couple of minutes to get um, through that. I think using this first spreadsheet is pretty simple and pretty quick. Okay, so once I have those results, I can, there's a couple of different ways I can check to, to see how well the distributions I picked did in relationship to you know, what I should get for the expected curve. So my, the output for my expected value is in column Q, and I can go back and compare it to you know, what I should have gotten. So I've got 0.8 versus 0.792, so those are pretty close. Um, 6.27 times 10 to the minus 7 versus 6.57 times 10 to the minus 7. Those are pretty close. So those numbers should be, they're, ne they're never going to be exactly the same, but we're trying to be as faithful to what our um, hydraulic engineer gave us. And that's usually what comes out of RMC RFA. The other way is just to look at the plot. And so the, the lines themselves are the... Um, the inputs that we gave in that first tab. The points, the squares, the X's, the diamonds, the triangles, those are the actual outputs from the distribution that we assigned. So if everything lines up on the line, which in this case it does, then we know we're being faithful to those results and you know we're good to use that going forward in the risk assessment. Sometimes when you have to extend your curves, particularly, you know, to talked about extending those up to the same maximum stage. Depending on how you extrapolate, some of these upper stages might not line up very good. And that just means you need to do a little trial and error on your extrapolation and either make it a little higher or a little lower until those line up. But usually the, the bottom stuff works really well. Cool. So once we have our um, stage frequency relationships and distributions assigned, uh, the next step is to start going through uh, each failure mode one by one. So I am going to um, keep this spreadsheet open because I'm going to need it. Data from here is going to feed into the PFM risk spreadsheet. RMC PFM risk is set up to be used during a team elicitation and is used to organize the data for a single potential failure mode that is a function of stage and that has an event tree of 10 nodes or less. The spreadsheet can be used to generate real-time results during a team elicitation. 
Values and formulas from the spreadsheet will later be used in RMC project risk when completing risk calculations for a project. To use the spreadsheet, macros must be enabled. The Excel add-on at risk is required to run a probabilistic analysis, but is not required to run a deterministic analysis. The yellow shaded cells are where the user will input data and the white cells are built in calculations. Gray cells do not require an input. Whenever you are copying and pasting input data, always paste as values because many of the cells are conditionally formatted. Also, to add reference lines on plots for key stages of interest, there's a table at the bottom of the cover sheet tab that you can fill out. For each worksheet, the top left corner will turn red if there's an error present in the worksheet. Sheets with errors will also be listed at the top of the Simulation Results tab worksheet. Also, the entire left side of all worksheets will turn red if the spreadsheet is populated with the at-rest simulation results. Always clear the simulation results prior to running a new simulation to shorten the runtime, because it will take at risk a very long time to start a simulation if you do not. Starting with the Hydrologic Hazard tab, select the vertical datum from the drop-down menu or type in the project datum into the box. Remember, the elevation datum must be consistent across all spreadsheets. Next, copy the inputs from the RMC Stage Frequency Distribution spreadsheet and paste these values into the table. Once that is complete, input the stage elevations lowest to highest that will be used to define the system response curve for the failure mode. If the system response probability has a known zero point, set the first stage to that elevation. You can always come back to this tab in the workbook to add more peak stages, but the low to high order must be maintained. There's also a plot of the stage frequency curve on this tab. Do not freak out if the mean at-risk markers do not plot on the expected curve at this point. They will not plot on the curve until after a simulation is run. Next, let's move to the life loss tab. Here, input the day and night exposure rates. Remember the exposures must sum to equal one. Next, select a life loss distribution, then click Execute to populate the other worksheets. You can choose between beta general, beta pert, triangular, and uniform distributions. Of these, beta pert and triangular distributions have been the ones most commonly used. More recently, risk assessment teams have been using percentile sampling, which samples the consequence data directly, instead of trying to find a representative distribution. This is also an option in the drop-down menu and has become the preferred method because it best recreates the results from the consequence model. In this worksheet, the table headers and cells that are shaded yellow to denote a user input will change based on the requirements of the distribution. Unused cells will be grayed out. Next, input breach life loss estimates for day and night. The estimates need to be input in order from lowest stage to highest stage. If the distribution is not selected, the spreadsheet will default to the most likely value. Scrolling down within the same worksheet, we'll do the same thing for the non-breach life loss, inputting the estimates in order from the lowest stage to the highest stage. If you want to use a static value for a given stage instead of a selected distribution, override the mean value for that stage and leave all other columns blank. This can be done in the breach life loss table as well. Inputting the economic cost is also done in a similar fashion. The estimates for breach and non-breach are input in order from lowest stage to highest stage. Uncertainty in the economic cost is typically not considered, so there are no options for distributions. The peak stages for economic cost inputs should be the same as the peak stages for the life loss inputs from the prior worksheet. We are now ready to start with the nodal estimates. At the top of the node worksheet, select the node type, failure, or intervention. Next, click on the peak stage at the top left corner of the table. This will populate the table with the peak stages to evaluate from the hydrologic loading tab. You can also use the drop-down to select the stages manually. 
The stages you evaluate for a given node do not have to be the same as those for other nodes. The only requirement is that the lowest and highest stages are the same for all nodes so that the spreadsheet can interpolate properly. On this worksheet are tables to record and summarize the elicitation responses. It is beneficial to have each elicitor use the RMC team elicitation template and email the results to the spreadsheet operator. That template is formatted specifically to be used with the spreadsheet, such that the spreadsheet operator can simply copy and paste the results as values into the table. This is much more efficient than trying to manually type in the elicited responses. If a second response is necessary, input those as well in the next table. For the second response, the cells are conditionally formatted to indicate a change from the first response. Green cells indicate a decrease from the first elicited probability, and the red cells indicate an increase. Summary statistics are tabulated at the bottom. The inner quartile is known as the middle 50, and it is the difference between the 25th and 75th percentile values. The lower this number, the tighter the spread of the elicited responses. A decrease in the inner quartile value is an indicator that the elicitation panel is moving towards a consensus. As a default, the spreadsheet reports the median of the elicited probabilities for the lowest reasonable, most likely, and highest reasonable values. But the drop-down box can be used to toggle between the median and the average of the elicited probabilities. The last table of each node worksheet is the place to input the consensus probabilities and to choose a representative probability distribution. This will be done by the elicitation team. Available probability distributions include triangular, uniform, log triangular, and log uniform. If a stage represents a zero threshold for the PFM, enter a zero for the lowest reasonable, most likely, and highest reasonable values. Once the consensus probabilities are input, verify that how the probabilities change with stage and that the selected probability distribution is appropriate. The consensus elicitation results and PDS for each pool are plotted below the consensus team estimate table and will be shown on the next slide. Here is a look at the plots included on each node worksheet. The probabilities are plotted with stage and the probability density function for the selected distribution is also provided. For the PDF, use the drop down menu to choose the stage elevation for the probability density function you want to display. Once all the data has been input, move on to the risk calculations worksheet. Here you will select an interpolation method from the drop down menu to be used for the system response. Options include linear, semi logarithmic, and z variant. You will also need to verify the life loss correlation matrices used in the worksheet. The spreadsheet defaults to perfect correlation between breach and non-breach life loss. To make the life loss distributions perfectly uncorrelated, click the plus button on the left to show the matrices, then change the bottom left hand portion of the matrices boxed in red. You'll change the values from 1 to 0 for both the day and night tables. Scrolling down in the risk calculations worksheet, you have the option to include non-exceedance. Even further down is where the user will choose between a probabilistic and deterministic analysis. If you choose deterministic, only the mean estimates will be calculated. To calculate uncertainty, probabilistic should be selected and at risk will be required to perform the analysis. To finish setting up the analysis, you will also need to set the loading partitions to evaluate. By default, the spreadsheet generates even partitions between the minimum and maximum stage of the stage frequency curve. These partitions can be changed to provide additional resolution around key elevations. It is important to note, however, that the same set of stage partitions should be used for all potential failure modes for a given project. If all steps were done correctly, everything should be set and ready to go. As part of the final check, go to the simulation results worksheet to verify that there are no errors and that the simulation results are clear. If the simulation results have not been cleared, click the clear simulation result button. 
Before running a simulation, it is always good practice to check the settings. The appropriate at-risk settings for a government computer should be preset in the spreadsheet, but these settings can be checked by clicking on the settings icon. Under the general tab, multiple CPU support should be disabled unless you're using a non-government computer or an air gap computer. Under the sampling tab, smart sensitivity analysis should also be disabled. Pick how many iterations you want, then click simulate to begin the simulation. A dialog box will pop up related to the correlation matrices. When it does, click yes to continue the simulation. After the simulation is complete, which may take a little bit depending on the selected number of iterations, click Plot Simulation Results on the Simulation Results Worksheet to populate all the plots and tables. After running a simulation, you can use Explore Data and click the footprint to plot and cycle through the iteration results. Use the arrow keys to move from one iteration to the next. The last step is to save the file. When you save the spreadsheet, a dialog box will pop up asking you how you want to save the simulation data. When files get large, it is best to save the data as an external file. Save the data file in the same folder as the spreadsheet. So like all of them, we've got the cover sheet where we can assign what the nodal descriptions are. Um, let's look at our, the actual homework assignment. So this is going to be an overtopping failure mode. I didn't give you all the descriptions for what the, the nodes are, but if you have them, you punch them in and when you do, they'll show up at the top when you evaluate the node. That's the, the handy part there. So to start, I need to pull in my uh, hydrologic hazard data. And that comes from the RMC stage frequency distribution spreadsheet that we just filled out. So I need to go back to that spreadsheet and I'm gonna go to the probability distribution tab. And then I'm gonna um, copy everything from C8 all the way down to what is that H57? And I want the whole table all the way down. Even if there's dashes, we're not using all the rows, I wanna copy and paste that entire table. So I copy that value. You wanna come in? What's that? Okay, so I'm gonna copy those values and I'm gonna paste them into um, C10 of this spreadsheet right here. And paste as values. So it pulls our, um, all those relationships in and plots them to the right. Uh, you will not see the X's for the, uh, the mean value until you run the simulation. So if we run it and were to come back here, just as a check, all those X's should line up right on that, um, on that black curve. But it's running this, we're pulling in the exact same distribution that we just ran, so we know it's good. You don't necessarily have to go back and check. All right, so the next thing that we input, and we input it on this tab, is the stages that we're gonna want to evaluate uh, the system response for, for this failure mode. So for our, going back to homework four, we want, sorry, when you got multiple spreadsheets, it's kind of hard to show on one screen. So if this starts getting too small, let me know. But we're gonna wanna punch in um, these peak pool values, those are going to be the um, stages that were evaluated. So let's punch those in. So I've got 582 582.3, 587.7, 588.3, 588.8, 590.1, and... 591.2. So in this example, it wasn't directly spelled out, but 582.3 is going to be your dam crest. 
and apparently we're pretty deficient because we're going to overtop by almost nine feet. And looking at some of these probabilities, and we'll get to that here in a little bit, <laughs> it looks like we either have a very, very robust section that's very resistant to overtopping, or we've got um, an event that's super, super flashy. It's just an exercise, so don't pay too much to the final result. But All right, so we've got our peak stages to evaluate. Those are all lined out. Next, we will want to put in our uh, life loss values. So the life loss you were given, at least for this example, is going to be the same for all failure modes. That's not always going to be the case. Um, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. So we'll start with our exposure, which was 0.42 for the day, 0.58 for the night. We are told to use a uh, beta PERT distribution for both breach and non-breach life loss. So we will choose beta PERT and click Execute. And that'll get our spreadsheet all ready to do that when it's time to run our simulation. All right, so now we're ready to copy and paste our uh, life loss data in. So starting with the daytime, we've got our peak stage. And again, always paste as values. And then we'll take our min, most likely in max, and paste those in. Let's see if we can see that a little better. We'll do the same thing for the night. I should say that out here, if for whatever, if we put in a relationship that's wrong, we should get an error message out to the side. So always look out to the side to make sure there's no errors. Um, and also if there's an error, this top left corner will turn red. And that's true for any of these spreadsheets. So if you see that turn red, then you know you've got something you need to fix. So I've got the breach life loss in for day and night. And now I need the non-breach life loss for day and night. Do the same thing. Okay. So if we had used different distributions, we might have needed a standard deviation or um, sometimes some of these headings change based on what you select. So just be aware of that. If you were to change this and click execute, sometimes it'll, depending on what you choose, it might override your data. So be aware of that. Be careful if you're trying to decide between two different things. So once we've got this table filled out, we can move on to uh, the economic cost which are given here. I've got them for um, breach and then non-breach. Now I need to be a little bit more careful on the non-breach. I didn't tell you all this and should have. When um, we get to the next spreadsheet for the project risk and it pulls in, you want the, um, the stages that you input for your economic cost to match those that you punched in for your life loss. Else some of your summary tables are gonna, will get a little messed up. Um, it doesn't change anything because these are both zero. So I just left those two off and then this is top of active storage. So I left put that one in there. If you had put you know, this full column in there, all the calculations would have been done right. There just would have been one page on the summary table that wouldn't have come in right, so be aware of that. All right, so that's all the um, the hydraulic hazard and the consequences. When you have failure modes that have similar consequences, and all failure modes are going to have the same hydrologic hazard, so once you have those in, you can actually save this spreadsheet and then use it as a template so you don't have to continue to repeat punching all that data in. The only thing you'll have to change for the, from one failure mode to the next would be the nodal inputs and system response. So that's a good time saver. 
Um, for today, I'm just going to go through how to do this for PFM1. Um, the process is exactly the same for PFM2 and 3. I just didn't see the need for you to watch me copy and paste any more than you have to. All right, so I've got that in, and I'm going to start moving into the nodal estimates for PFM1. So normally, um, you know, these estimates are going to be, here, let's make this bigger. Sorry, I want to make the screen bigger, but my toolbar is in the way. There we go. So normally, we're going to get these probabilities through elicitation, and this spreadsheet is set up to um, help you do that. So it'll pull in, you know, as the estimators make their estimates, we can punch them in here. If there's a second response, we can add that in here, but none of that data gets put into any of the calculations until you put in a consensus team estimate. Only the consensus team estimate gets run through uh, the risk calculations tab. So be aware of that. So to set up the node spreadsheet, we need to pick which peak stages we're gonna evaluate. And there's a couple different ways to do this. The only ones that you're allowed to use are the ones that you predefined on the uh, hydrologic hazard tab. And you can use the drop down to select them, or if you just want to put all the ones that you have in there, you can click uh, where it says peak stage and it'll punch them all in for you. All right, so I've got, let's make this small again. So I have the stages that I'm going to evaluate, and now I need to pull in my, uh, my data and my distributions. So for this distribution, we're told to use a triangular distribution. Um, somebody over email asked me, how do we decide between stage independent and stage dependent? It depends on the node and the probabilities. If the probabilities change with a peak stage, they're going to be dependent on the stage. If it doesn't change with a change in peak stage, then it's going to be independent. Uh, the reason you have that drop, if you choose dependent every time, it's going to work fine. The reason I have the independent in there is there's no reason to run the same distribution five different times. So it'll speed up your runtime if you choose independent when the node is stage independent, if that makes sense. So for this first one, we see that our probabilities change with stage, so it's going to be stage dependent. So I'll choose that one. And then I need to click execute to get my spreadsheet ready. So then from there, I can copy and paste as values in here, and node 1 should be all set. We'll have a plot um, of probability versus stage that you, you as a team can look at to make sure that you know, the trend is following you know, a reasonable path, and then you can also look at the, the PDFs for each of those um, distributions that you assign to make sure that those make sense. Okay, so I have uh, my estimate for node one. I'm going to do the same thing for node two. So I click peak stage to get the stages I want to evaluate. And scroll down here. This one's also going to be a triangular distribution. Um, these change, so they are going to be state, stage dependent. Execute the spreadsheet ready. And then I can copy and paste his values in there. All right. And then continue down the line for node three and node four. The one difference for node three is my node type just changed. These first two were for um, failure nodes that are part of the event tree. If the node is related to intervention, we're going to want to call that out. And the reason we do this is by policy, we have to report our risk estimates for with intervention and without. So we need to tell the spreadsheet which things are related to intervention so it knows what to pull out when it's looking at those 
uh, two different scenarios. So we'll select intervention for node three, click to get our stages. Again, this is triangular, uh, again, de dependent on stage, execute. And then copy and paste. And then the last node for this failure mode is node four. It's our failure node. Repeat that process one more time. So it's triangular distribution again. It's also stage dependent. And then we can copy and paste that in. Always as values. Okay, so if everything was done right, I can go over to the uh, risk calculations tab and look and make sure that the values were pulled in correctly into this table. So that should be all filled out. Um, we have the choice here of how we want to uh, interpolate. Um, typically for overtopping, we use uh, linear interpolation. I think if you plot it out, you will get a um, a better R squared value if you go log for this one. So we'll go ahead and do semi log. I didn't check Z variate. Um, like I said in session two, it, it's hard to plot in Z variate, so we usually don't. And then and it doesn't really change the results by too much. So go semi log there. And th this gives you a look at kind of what happens with um, intervention and without intervention. So you see without intervention, it's left out node three because we specified it as an intervention node. But when we consider intervention, it's got those probabilities in here. Okay. So that should be all set. Um, we can scroll down the, the spreadsheet defaults to uh, include non-exceedance, which is typically what you should do. Uh, if there's some reason that you don't want to include that, there's a toggle here where you can click to remove it. We're going to leave it in for now. And then all our consequence data was pulled in. Same, same deal here. It all looks good. And then this is where all the real calculations are happening down here in these tables. So the last thing we need to check before we run a simulation would be our stage partitions. The spreadsheet defaults to, to splitting into even stage partitions from our minimum loading all the way up to our maximum loading. Uh, knowing nothing else, that, that's plenty good for what we're trying to do um, today. Um, it is a good idea to go through and look and make sure that you've got um, enough resolution around key inflection points and things like that. So these don't have to be even. You just need to make sure that you know, from one stage to the next that it is increasing from one to the next, that's it. So we're gonna leave that there. Um, whatever we use for one failure mode, we're gonna need to use for our second, third, and so on failure modes. They all need to be the same, else the total, um, the project risk spreadsheet won't work right if they're not the same, okay? So once I have those in, I can go over to the uh, simulation results and we always want to make sure before we run a simulation that we've cleared the results. We also want to make sure that we don't have any other spreadsheets that have at-risk data in them because when you go to run it it's going to look through every single spreadsheet and run every single distribution and that can really bog things down and really slow things down. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm, I'm done with the stage frequency distribution sheet I'm gonna go ahead and save that and close it. I can leave the homework file open because it's just, there's no um, at-risk cells in there, so it won't slow us down at all. So we make sure things are clear. If they hadn't been clear, you could click this button to clear it. You'll also know that there's um, simulation data in the spreadsheet because 
you know, this column on every spreadsheet will turn red, like you'll see in a moment. All right, so let's check our at-risk settings. C multiple CPUs disabled, and smart sensitivity is disabled, so we're ready to go. Now, this spreadsheet is set up, again, for use during an elicitation and to be run during the elicitation so that you can get some real-time results so you as a team can look at it, make sure it makes sense, you know, before everybody parting ways and going back to the office and doing other things. To get a good representative um, idea of what the mean's gonna be, you're not gonna have to run all 10,000 iterations. You can if you want, and that's gonna give you a better idea of what your uncertainty spread is. But because our, um, because our decisions are made mostly or specifically off the mean, that's going to be our best estimate. We don't have to run quite as many. I, I usually run 1,000 during a team elicitation. Um, for right now, let's just run 500 just to speed things up a little bit. And you'll see that the, the mean is going to come out pretty good, though. So these um, warnings about the correlation matrices will pop up, and again, that's by design, so we'll click yes, and then we should be all set. So typically for one of the questions I got is how long should it take for one of these simulations to run? And I would say it all depends on how many failure modes you have and how complicated um, the failure mode is. For a given failure mode, it's usually going to be about um, five minutes or so for a thousand iterations. So obviously, if you're going to try to do 10,000 iterations, it's going to be about 10 times that, so 45 minutes. So in times of the essence, you can um, knock the iterations down just to make sure that everything looks good and you're getting the results you want before then getting into the, the final one where you're going to want to do a lot more iterations. So we'll give it its last 30 seconds here, and then we'll show you how to pull up some of the results. I mean, for the most part, you know, all this stuff is just a exercise of following the recipe and copying and pasting into the right spots. Now that I have, now that that's run to actually see the results, I need to click plot simulation results and it'll go through and it's going to pull, um, the data from at risk and populate all our spreadsheets, hopefully without crashing. Notice how the bar turned red. So that tells me that my simulation results are in the spreadsheet and haven't been cleared. And for this one, you can faintly see the, um, iteration points here. Um, the more you run, we're plotting them semi-transparently, so the more you run and the more those points kind of cluster around each other, the darker those are going to be. So you get a good visual of, um, I guess, where the risk is most likely to fall. You've got summary data out to the right where you have your, um, your mean APF, your mean average annual life loss, and then your end bar. And then you also have the uh, percentages of points that fall into the different regions of the chart. So in this case, we had 13% that was above our average annual life loss guideline. We had 24% that fell within the low probability, high consequence box, and then none of them fell above the APF guideline. And then if you scroll down, we've got um, our cumulative distribution functions, our, our CDFs. Um, we can use um, these cells out here to edit the um, chart axes quickly and easily. We also have what we're calling risk profile plots where we plot the um, APF versus peak stage. And we have all that we have all the same stuff for average annual life loss. And then our 
average annual economic cost. Okay, so we're going to repeat that process. I'm not going to do it today, but you would repeat that process for every failure mode. So coming out of a licitation, you should have all these failure mode spreadsheets all complete and ready to go. And then the only thing you'll have to do after the elicitation is pull them all into the project risk spreadsheet. The RMC project risk spreadsheet is used to calculate the marginal risk for each potential failure mode and to combine these risks to calculate the total risk. As with the other spreadsheets, macros must be enabled and the Excel add-on at risk is required to run a probabilistic analysis. The yellow shaded cells are where values are to be pasted from the RMC PFM risk spreadsheet. Yellow shaded cells outlined in red are where formulas are to be pasted from the RMC PFM risk spreadsheet. The spreadsheet can accommodate up to 10 potential failure modes. Starting on the cover sheet tab, input PFM numbers and short descriptions for the failure modes into the table. Worksheets for each potential failure mode will appear automatically, but the failure mode numbers must be unique and the PFMs must be input one at a time. Next, select the vertical datum from the drop-down menu on the right, or just type in the project datum into the box. The elevation data must be consistent across all spreadsheets. Moving to the PFM worksheets. The data for these worksheets will come directly from the RMC PFM risk spreadsheet that you filled out for each failure mode. To start bringing in the data, copy the team elicitation summary from the risk calculations tab of the RMC PFM risk spreadsheet and paste these values into cell C6. Copy the entire table, not just the stages and the nodes that have data. Select an interpolation method for the PFM from the drop-down menu. Options include linear, semi-logarithmic, and z-variant. Next, copy the Considering Intervention Nodal Estimate table from the RMC PFM risk spreadsheet and paste these formulas into cell F70. Again, this time we are pasting formulas, not values, because the cells are outlined in a red box. For the next table, copy the Annual Exceedance Probability Input table and the Assigned Probability Distributions from the RMC PFM risk spreadsheet and paste its values into cell C209. For the PFM consequences, copy the exposure rates from the RMC PFM risk spreadsheet and paste into cell D321. Select a distribution to match using the drop-down menu and click Execute. Copy the breach life loss, non-breach life loss, and economic tables from the RMC PFM risk spreadsheet and paste into the RMC project risk spreadsheet. If you're using percentile sampling, the input tables will be to the right of the table shown here, but the procedure is essentially the same. If necessary, update the correlation matrices in the RMC project risk spreadsheet to match those to the RMC PFM risk spreadsheet. In continuing to work down the PFM worksheet, use the buttons to add or remove the non-exceedance. Then, copy the stage partitions from the RMC PFM risk spreadsheet and paste them into cell C430. This completes the input for the first failure mode. If other potential failure modes are being evaluated, go to the worksheet for the next PFM. Click the button in the top left corner to set up the worksheet. The button will change from a triangle to an X. The spreadsheet can be cleared of all formulas by pressing the X. All unused sheets should be cleared for formulas prior to running an at-risk simulation. From here, repeat the prior steps for all other PFMs. Just note that the loading and the non-breach consequences will already be populated in the worksheet. Once all the data for each potential failure mode has been entered, the last thing we need to do is to go to the SRP Adjustments tab to assign how the potential failure modes will be combined. Use the drop-down menu to choose a risk model and, if necessary, to assign a dominant failure mode. Only one failure mode can be dominant. 
if a failure mode is dominant. The other failure modes cannot occur unless the dominant failure mode does not occur. A dominant failure mode can only be chosen for the exclusive and common cause adjustment risk models. A dominant failure mode cannot be assigned when using the competing risk model. Next, you have the option to make adjustments to combine similar failure modes. If the same potential failure mode is evaluated in multiple sections, or multiple exit locations are evaluated for the same failure path, the individual system response curve should be combined into a single curve by selecting the maximum system response probability at each peak stage. To combine similar failure modes in this manner, write an if statement for each stage to assign the failure mode with the maximum system response probability, a one, and the other failure mode of the group, a value of zero. If a given failure mode is not being combined with any others as described above, assign a value of one for each stage. You'll need to do this for both tables, with and without intervention. We now have everything we need to run a simulation, but before doing so, check the settings. The appropriate at-risk settings for a government computer should be preset in the spreadsheet, but the at-risk settings can be checked by clicking on the settings icon. Under the general tab, multiple CPU simulations should be disabled unless you're using a non-government computer or an air gap computer. Under the sampling tab, smart sensitivity analysis should also be disabled. The number of iterations should be set to at least 10,000. Click Simulate to begin the simulation. Two dialog boxes will pop up. Click Yes both times to continue the simulation. After running the simulation, you can review the tabular results on the incremental, non-breach, and residual risk tabs. But to plot the simulation results, you'll need to use the Risk Summary and Plots template. When you save the spreadsheet, a dialog box will pop up asking you how you want to save the simulation data. When files get large, it is best to save the data as an external file. Save the data file in the same folder as the spreadsheet. I just asked if I wanted to change the settings and all of these spreadsheets should be, should be preset. Um, to have the settings the way you need them for a, a government computer. All right, so to start with the um, project risk spreadsheet, there's some stuff that we're gonna have to punch in on our cover sheet for this to work. So for every failure mode that we punch in, it's gonna make a new tab here down at the bottom. Let's move it so you can actually see where it comes in. So for our example, we had three potential failure modes at PFM1. See the tab show up that was overtopping. I had PFM2 and I had PFM3. I forget which was which. Let's look. So PFM2 was backward erosion and piping and three was concentrated leak erosion. Okay. Also on this, um, on this tab is the place where you select the vertical datum. Again, it needs to be consistent across the spreadsheets. And then you should be all set to start uh, inputting data. And the only data that you really have to input is going to be in the individual failure mode tabs. And then once that's in, if we're going to do any kind of adjustment to those, common cause or otherwise, that would happen on this tab. All the tabs that are highlighted in black are going to be where the results summary are pulled in. So those are all summary tables. No inputs are required there. It's just for you to, I guess, look at the results when the simulation is complete. So to pull in my data from for PFM1, oops, I'm going to need to pull, go back to my um, PFM risk spreadsheet. So the first thing I need to do is copy C6 through 
through N46. That's this table right here and paste as values over here. So I'm gonna copy this whole table, including the rows and cells that aren't being used. And there are usually gonna be some that are blank. I'll copy that and then I'm gonna paste as values right here. Okay, so that's pulling in the data and now it knows to, you know, this is what the spreadsheet's gonna pull from when we run a simulation. So next step, we need to pick what our system response probability interpolation method is gonna be. We chose semi-log, so we'll make that match. And then down here, where the actual distributions are gonna be, this is where we're gonna need to paste formulas. Okay, I think a couple people pasted as values and got some wonky results. That's because the distributions you were trying to pull in weren't distributions, they were just static values. So anytime you see something um, that's highlighted in red with a red box, that's where we're not going to want to paste values, we're going to want to paste as formulas. So we're going to copy F70 through O72. So that is F, F70 right here under node 1. And go all the way down to the bottom and copy this whole guy right here. And then we want to paste formulas. And formulas is going to be the one that has the FX on it. Give it a minute and it will populate. Okay, so if it's done right, you'll see that the, the distribution is in there. And that's really important. So once that's set, that's all everything I need for the system response. I'm going to need to then pull in the stage frequency data from this spreadsheet. So I'll scroll down and I need to get C209 to H258. So that's everything over to column H and again the entire table including any that have dashes down at the bottom. Now on this one I'm going to want to paste as values. That's all set. Now, right now, this is just set to look at, um, there, there is no distribution set in there until I click execute. So I need, that's the next step. Once I've pasted those things in as values, I'll click execute. And each of those will get the specified distribution that I have assigned in column H. If I didn't do that, it would run three distributions for each stage and it would really make the runtime go a lot longer. So that's why that execute button's in there. So we'll give it a minute to um, fill all those in and then we'll be one step closer to having everything in. Again, this is another example where you don't want to have too many spreadsheets open at the same time. You want to have the, only the spreadsheets that you're really working on, else it can make things go painfully slow. All right, so I've got my stage frequency data in there. It's got, it found the distributions that I was looking for. This basically looks like the same table that we saw in the other spreadsheets, so we're set. Uh, now we need our consequence data, which will, again, be a straight copy and paste. And everything's formatted the exact same, so we can just copy and paste as values to get all this filled out. Now, again, similar to what we had to do with the stage frequency curve and that execute button, we need to choose what, our, um, what distribution we want to use for our life loss. We're using a beta PERT, which we can see right there. So we will choose that and click Execute. And it'll go line by line and change the code for the distribution that we want.
guess one thing you could do um, to kind of speed things up as you're setting it up, you could turn off automatic calculation. Um, it'll turn into a bunch of spreadsheet algebra because things obviously won't be calculating. But it should go through this kind of stuff faster. But then the flip side is you got to make sure that you re-enable it. Else when you run your simulation, it won't calculate ever and you'll get 10,000 results that are basically not changed because you're not calculating anything. So we'll wait for that. And then once that's done, we'll copy and paste the consequence data straight out of this, from our PFM sheet into our project risk sheet. Come on. Up here under formulas and calculation options, you can click manual if you want. Thank you. So we will pull in our day life loss. Again, we need to copy the entire table, even the rows we're not using, and paste as values. Do the same thing for the night. Again, and then keep scrolling to the right. And I'm not sure why there's data in there. I must not have cleared it out from the last time I used it. But Oop. I'm putting stuff in the wrong spot. I was putting breach stuff into the non-breach. Let's move that up. Very helpful to have two screens going at the same time, for sure. All right, so I've got the economic cost in there, and now I need my non-breach life can loss. You can you repeat why you um, chose the distribution before turning and placing the values? Why before? You don't have to choose it before. The, the order in which you do it doesn't matter too much. Um, if I had chosen a... Um, like a beta distribution, the inputs are going to be different. So those, when you select it and click execute, the headers are going to change. So instead of being, you know, expected min, most likely max, it could be, um, it could change to an alpha value or whatever based on what distribution there is. So it's, it's best to select it first. We know what it is going in because we already uh, assigned it in the PFM sheet. So I would go ahead and do that first. That way all the tables are going to match with the inputs that you know you need. And then you should be able to just uh, paste in directly. Does that make sense? I'm, af I'm afraid, I don't, I don't want to show you what happens if I change. If I were to change this to beta general and click, well, actually I just do it. See how all those changed? The headers changed. I need different information yeah. for that particular distribution. That's the only thing that's going to change. You could still paste all these values in and then, you know, change it last and click execute. It really doesn't matter. The order is not important. Cool. Thank you. Very good. All right. So I've got my consequence data in. I've got my uh, hydrologic hazard, the system response. So the last thing I need to do is to paste in the um, what I want to use for my stage partitions. So I will copy this, all those yellow cells there, and then paste as values. And again, you've got um, options to add or remove non-exceedance. We want it added. So we're just going to leave that as is. If I click this, it'll take that, it'll adjust this probability slightly. All right, so I think that's everything I need for PFM1. There's no other inputs that I need. If I scroll down here, there's stuff that I can look at after I run the simulation where I can look at, you know, how things change for a specific range like APF, average annual life loss, but you know, those are all preset and 
you're only allowed to look at certain values down there. So, oh, I've got so many decimals there. All right, so that's PFM1. We would repeat all of this for PFM2 and PFM3. And I've, in the interest of time, I went ahead and um, preset these. I guess the one thing to remember is when you first, here, let's, when you first um, get a secondary spreadsheet, so your second failure mode, your third failure mode, all others but the first, when I punch this in, let's add a fourth one. I will get a, the spreadsheet will come unpopulated. Reason being is if I'm not gonna use one of these spreadsheets, I want it to be cleared out because I don't want at risk searching through it and trying to do stuff when it doesn't need to. So when I first set up that spreadsheet, I need to click this triangle to populate it. And it's gonna pull a lot of the formulas from, um, the same ones that you're using in your first spreadsheet and pull it over so that everything's the same. So once it does its thing, which can take a minute, then it's ready to start putting your data in. Um, you'll note that in all of these tabs, it's always going to reference back to the hydrologic hazard for the first one. We only want to run the distribution once. We don't want to run the same distributions for each failure mode. We want it to be consistent across all the failure modes. So that's why it's doing that. Um, it'll also pull in the same non-breach consequences for each of your failure modes because those will always be consistent too. And then it, and it'll also pull in the stage partitions because they need to be the same from one failure mode to the next. So once I've got um, let's, let's say I accidentally added one and I don't want this failure mode anymore. You can click the X and it'll clear it all out again and get it back to, um, basically how it was when we first saw the sheet. So it doesn't bog down our runtime. So I'll clear all that, get that out of the way and delete that sheet here in a second. And then to make it disappear, they're, they're just hidden sheets, basically. So if I delete that, it's going to hide that sheet. And we're set. Okay. So once I have all of the uh, inputs in for failure mode 1, 2, and 3, the next thing I need to do is to decide if I'm going to adjust these system response probabilities in any way. Uh, the homework told us that... we were going to apply common cause for all three failure modes and that we were not going to assume any of the failure modes to be dominant. So I've got check boxes where I can include yes or no on common cause adjustment. We're not always going to use it. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Um, if we were to assign a dominant failure mode, that's the one where it um, basically makes the other failure modes conditional on that dominant failure mode. So if the dominant failure mode occurs, the others can't. If the dominant failure mode does not occur, then I can have the other one. So it, it pulls that failure mode to the front of the tree. But that won't come up too much. All right, so then scrolling down this first table is just all the unadjusted system response probabilities at each uh, midpoint peak stage. It does those calculations for you. This next step is hey, where... Dana. Yes. Let me just double check. You said um, the non-dominant failure mode can't occur if the dominant one does occur. That's correct. In the case where you design dominant or non-dominant. That's correct. In fact, here, let me, let me pull up, uh, I think it was session one what I'm talking about there. This will make it a little more clear. So for example, if I assigned overtopping here to be the dominant failure mode, if overtopping occurs, the dam breaches and none of those other failure modes can occur. If 
it doesn't, so I, I don't overtop, then I can, I don't breach by overtopping, then I would have um, these other failure modes. So these failure modes would be weighted by the complement of my overtopping failure mode. Does that make sense? Yep. Very good. Thank you. Yep. All right. So the, the next step, and this, this can be a, a little confusing. It depends on, I guess, how you've evaluated your failure modes and how you want to combine them. So in most instances, if you've got, you know, three different internal, you know, three different failure modes that are pretty different, you know, all the values in this table are just going to be ones. This really comes into play where you've got, say, a failure mode um, that has same pathway but two different exit conditions. Let's say one, you know, maybe we could heave something, you know, heave a blanket at the toe, or we could exit further downstream. We're gonna. T this gives you the option to pick one or the other, to pick the maximum of the two. So let's say let, let's pretend that you know. Failure mode one and failure mode two were at you know the same failure path but different exit conditions. I would want to write an if statement based on these probabilities to assign a one to the failure mode that had the highest system response. So if I'm going through these, all of these should be one, and then once I get here, it's going to switch over to failure mode one. We don't have that problem here. All these failure modes are unique, so I can just punch in one for all of them. I'm not doing any kind of uh, weighting or adjustment or anything like that. Basically, on this, on each individual failure mode spreadsheet, it's going to take its system response and then adjust it by that probability that I'm punching in there. So if I punch it a zero, that particular um, stage of that particular failure mode is not going to get incorporated in the total. I want it in this instance to be included in the total, so all of these are going to be ones. I hope that was clear. It's kind of a mouthful. And I'll need to do that for both without intervention and with intervention. So we do that to fill out the rest of the table and all this other stuff, the common cause adjustment, any adjustments for dominance, the spreadsheet's going to handle automatically. As you can see, the common cause adjustment really doesn't do anything on this one because the failure mode probabilities are really low, and um, mainly that's the main reason and kind of different. All right. So once I've got all the failure modes in, I've got this system response probability adjustment tab filled out, I'm ready to run a simulation. I can um, let's see, again, before I do that, I want to make sure that I close these other sheets. Let's go ahead and get this one out of here. I'll save it just because. Now, I, I typically don't save the um, simulation data for the um, individual failure mode sheets because that's not something that's ever going to get reported in the total. Again, that was just so when you're doing an elicitation, you can see things real time. You can if you want, but I, I don't usually save them. So I'll close that and get that out of the way. And then we'll be ready to run the project risk. Close that. Again, check my settings, that's disabled, so that's good. And smart sensitivity is enabled, I need that to be disabled, so I'll click OK. And then I'm ready to run. Um, I'm not gonna run the whole thing, because I don't see any need for you all to sit and watch a progress bar. Um, when we do this, we typically use 10,000 iterations to get you know, a good estimate of what our uncertainty scatter is. It usually takes about an hour to an hour and a half to, you know, for a standard two to three failure mode sheet. So it's really important to check your data, make sure you got everything in right, because you don't want to waste that time running only to have a mistake and have to run it again. So that can be pretty annoying. Um, I've got this spreadsheet run 
elsewhere. So let's go ahead and I'll save this just to save it. And then I'm going to open up one where I've already, it's got all the same data in it, but I've run it and I can just pull the data in. So let's get this out of here. That's smaller. And this will also show how we um, can pull in data too from an old run. So once I open that sheet, if I have at risk running already, it's going to ask me, do I want to open the at risk results from that file? And I can click yes, I do want those. So it'll pull it all in for me. And enable macros. And it should have everything that I need there. Okay. Um, if for whatever reason it doesn't ask me if I want to pull in the data, I can go over here to utilities and then choose to open the simulation file and then look for the one that I need. It should be in the same, keep it in the same folder as um, the spreadsheet that it goes to. All right, so I have my, um, my data run here. I can look at the different summary tabs and see, you know, what's my APF for each failure mode, both with and without intervention, average annual life loss, what have you. Um, I've got all of the um, things for each partition split out by incremental risk, non-breach risk, and then also residual risk. And in all of these, if you scroll down to the bottom, um, we also have all of the data that's used to make the big FN chart. So there's a lot of stuff that's tied into these spreadsheets. So the next thing we do once we've got all this run is we, we need to plot all this stuff for like a report. The RMC risk summary and plot spreadsheet links with the RMC project risk spreadsheet and summarize the risk assessment results in tables and plots. To use the spreadsheet, macros must be enabled. The RMC Project Risk Spreadsheet must be open at the same time as this spreadsheet, and at risk must be running if a probabilistic analysis was performed. To add reference lines on plots for key stages of interest, fill out the table at the bottom of the cover sheet tab. Each worksheet is formatted for printing. When printing to a PDF, use Microsoft Print to PDF for best results. Start, type in the file name of the RMC Project Risk Spreadsheet with its file extension into the box. It needs to be an exact match. If you change the file name, it will be different than what is shown in the example. The list of risk driver potential failure modes will populate once you have properly linked to the correct spreadsheet. The RMC Project Risk Spreadsheet must also be open for the links to work. On the PFM Risk Summary tab, use the drop-down menu to select the PFM. The tables and plots will update automatically after a PFM is selected. If you want to print the data for a potential failure mode, click the Update Header button before doing so. Please note it may take a few minutes for the macro to finish running. On the Total Risk Summary tab, the spreadsheet will automatically plot the little FN chart with uncertainty scatter the big FN chart, the individual risk, and CDFs for the annual probability of failure, average annual life loss, and average annual economic cost. The only plot that requires additional user input is the plot of the individual risk, as shown here. The user must input the fatality rate for the person or persons most at risk. I'm going to open up the uh, risk summary and plot spreadsheet and go over to the cover sheet. The cover sheet is where I'm going to link these two spreadsheets together. I need to punch the, the spreadsheet name and its extension right here. So this one was RMC Project Risk dot XLSB. Those are all binary sheets and I click enter and it should pull in so you can see everything is linked together 
All right. Uh, if you scroll down, there are there's spots where if you wanted to add reference lines to your plots for say top of active storage or pool of record, top of dam, top of levee, whatever, you have the option to put that down here on the cover sheet. So um, once that's all linked, you can just peruse your data. So we'll go to the hy hydrologic hazard. All this stuff is formatted to plot in a nice um, folio, if you will, that pulls everything together. And you can just stick that into appendix to show all the inputs and give somebody everything they would need if they wanted to try to recreate the risk assessment. Again, it'll pull out the plots, show how well we matched um, the, the outputs with our inputs. We can see the um, our non-breach tables and life loss. Here's what I was talking about with making sure that the stages for our life loss matches the stages with our economic cost. If I had added those other two pools earlier, these would be shifted down by two rows, which wouldn't wouldn't be helpful. So make sure that you know whatever stages you use for life loss, you use for economic cost, and then your tables will come out right. So I can look at the different um, life loss plots, and then I can go over here and pull up the stuff for an individual failure mode. So again, these are formatted to plot. Um, it's kind of a pain because you have to plot each failure mode individually. I couldn't, I didn't want to make 10 of these sheets. It runs slow enough as it is. So for each one that you pick, you can click update header and it'll pull the um, failure mode title up to the header when you print. Um, and then you can stitch all those together to make one good PDF. But you get your system response curve and its uncertainty. You will get um, we got our plots, and then we've got our scatter plot for that specific failure mode, PFM one. You can see it for PFM two. If we give it a minute to calculate, a little different, more impact from intervention on that one. And then the same thing for PFM3. And then lastly, we have the total risk summary. So it'll pull everything in for what our incremental risk is, what our non-breach risk is, and then our residual. We'll have our summary table for the given failure modes, and then how those plot how the expected probabilities plot on the FN chart, and then the uncertainty scatter in the total. And this is what I was looking for um, with the homework when I asked for a screenshot. I was looking for this chart and these tables out here. I think some people sent me the risk for PFM1, which should have two failure modes kind of real tight close to each other. Give it a minute. Kind of right on the line. Yeah, something like this. So there's a number of people who sent me this. It's probably correct, but my total is going to be more like that. If I were to have run more iterations, my spread is going to get, I think we did a thousand here. Our spread is going to probably get a little bit further out, but Again, pretty good representation, and your mean shouldn't change much. Um, the mean that you see on the screen from me should be pretty close to what you got. It's not going to be exact because it's a, you know, it's it's going to change with each simulation, but it should be within a decimal point or two of uh, what I have calculated here. And then the only thing on this. Um, get it to calculate for me. The only thing in the risk summary and plots um, spreadsheet that is a, a true input that impacts any of these plots 
is going to be for the individual risk. So I'll scroll down and you have the opportunity to punch in an exposure and a fatality rate. And a lot of times, you know, for expediency, you will assume that the exposure is one and then pull the max fatality rate possible from life sim, which I think is 83%. In FIA, it used to be 0.91, um, but I think with life sim, it's 0.83 now. And then that'll plot this. We usually don't spend too much time on individual risk because if we satisfy our APF guideline, which is 10 to the minus four, we know that we satisfy the individual limit, which is 10 to the minus four also. So, you know, if you've got something that low, that's as much effort that I would spend on that. Um, if you scroll down, we also have plots for uh, big FN charts where we can look at our incremental, non-breach, and residual risk. And then you've got your um, percentiles for each of those plots. Non-breach. F dollar chart, and then CDFs for our total APF, APF versus peak stage. So all those same plots that we were looking at for the failure modes. And that's it. Um, only other thing I'll add is when you go to make these into a PDF and print them, I find that Microsoft uh, Print to PDF does a better job with the FN charts for whatever reason. Um, I think um, Adobe PDF has gotten a lot better than it used to be, so that might be an okay solution, but I usually go here. It makes the file size a little bigger, but your, your plots come out prettier. This concludes Module 4 of the course. Please complete the rest of Homework 4 to get credit for the module. If you do not have access to a working copy of At Risk, complete the calculations using the deterministic option within the spreadsheet. Once complete, take a screenshot of the FN chart and send it to RMC Training at usace.army.mil with the subject as DLS 105 Homework 4 to help us keep track of the submittals. Thanks in advance for your cooperation. If you have trouble with the homework, please reach out to the instructors through the email address on the screen or by emailing us directly. We will go over the solution to the homework assignment during the live question and answer portion, which will be in a few weeks. Also, at the end of the live session, you will be asked to take a short quiz so we can give you credit for your participation. If you miss the live session, a recording will be posted to the RMC website. The quiz will stay open until the day of the next live session. Please check the course schedule for dates and times. See you again for Module 5.